wanted to use really sure. one The ultimate responsibility for our social well-being rests on us as a people. What we do as parents and neighbors and members of a church, a charity or community will often have a greater impact on our nation's future than what we do as voters or even as a senator. A strong America is not possible without strong Americans, a people formed by the values necessary for success. The values of education and hard work, strong marriages and empowered parents. These are the values that made us the greatest nation ever. And these are the values that will lead us to a future even better than our past. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss this today. Thank you very much. Now I can have some water without people making fun of me. Right? This is always the fun part. Senator, uh, when it comes to abortion, is all that is needed to overturn Roe v. Wade, or does the government need to do more to help pregnant women and young families? If so, what policies would you suggest? I think that's right. The second part, too, as I outlined in the speech, I think uh, while we continue to have this debate about what our law should be with regards to abortion and at what stage it should be restricted and so forth, I think it's critically important to also have a support network for women who face this difficult choice. And so clearly that means, obviously, opportunities for adoption if that's the road that they choose. But it also means the opportunity to help uh, women who, quite frankly, in many instances are going to have to face these children without the help of a father. And that's why I outlined some of the challenges that are unique to single women in America. Uh, and I've, I was asked the other day why I always focus on that so much. And the answer is because I know so many that have impacted my life. I recall and uh, uh, a few years ago, this is not related to the issue of abortion, but it is related to the issue of how difficult it is for single parents today. Um, I had a, a young lady who worked in my office and she was raising her daughter basically by herself. And she worked for me at the state legislature, so I didn't set her salary, but it wasn't a lot of money. And she really struggled, it was tough. She did a great job with that daughter of hers who's gone on to a great career, but it was difficult. And the only way she was ever gonna improve her life economically and the opportunities is she had to go back to school. But how is she gonna go back to school if she has to work full time and also raise her daughter? And I know many people like that. I know a mother on my son's football team who lost a job because her boss wanted her to till stay till seven, but she couldn't because daycare closed at 6.30. She had to get there. And the only way that they can improve their lives is by getting a job that provides more flexibility and more financial, stabi uh, more financial stability. But increasingly in the 21st century, that means education. So you, she couldn't just drop everything and go to school for four years. And if you look at our higher education system today, this is just one example of some of the impediments that are faced. Our higher education isn't, system isn't built for, for people who face this challenge. It's largely built for people that are gonna go to school for four years full time or part time as a commuter student, but it, it provides very few affordable and flexible options for people who have to work full time and raise a family to acquire the skills they need for a better paying job so that they're not making $10 an hour, but that they're making $50 an hour. The long story short is, because she had a very flexible boss, and because the state legislature had a program, my aide was able to become a paralegal. And today she makes four times as much as she ever would have made had she been stuck in that job for the rest of her life. There are millions of women like that that don't have that opportunity, and if they're raising children, even less so. 
And unless we confront that as part of a holistic approach to this challenge, we're going to continue to leave millions of people behind with, with no access to a quality of opportunity. Thank you, Senator. Um, the next question is a personal one. How do you manage your time between family and politics? And what does your family think about politics? <laughs> um, well, my family, had, you know, when I was running for office, and I see a couple of reporters here that covered my race, so they'll heard this joke a million times, they'll groan. But um, when I was first running for office, there were only about five or six people on earth that thought I could win. And four of them lived in my home. Five of them lived in my home. Four of them were under the age of 10. <laughs> um, it is, and I wrote about this extensively in my book, An American Son, now available on paperback, if you're interested. <laughs> um, it's one of the hardest parts of it. And I'll give you examples and, uh, of, of what I mean by that. Um, there are things I just miss now because I have to be here. And I'm honored to be here and I, and I love serving here. But there are times that I just can't get there for whatever it may be. My son had a kindergarten award ceremony I wasn't at. I get the videos, but I'm not there. And I think that my children understand that what I'm doing is important and it's a job and other people have jobs that they can't be there, but that bothers me. And I do worry, it does, conflict me that I, sometimes my obligations in this job seem to infringe upon my obligations in my most important job, in my opinion, as a father and as a husband. But I have it easy compared to other people. Despite what I just outlined to you, there are people in America today that face a challenge much more difficult than mine. And you can ask them. If you work at a job and you have to take your kids and the only time the dentist can see them is at 1030, maybe your boss will let you go, but you won't get paid. Or maybe if you do that too many times, you'll get fired. That happens. That's real. People face that. I, I don't know how many kids have never participated in after school activities, and it breaks your heart because they see all their other friends talking about the soccer team and the dance recital. They've never done any of these things because their parents can't afford them, and quite frankly, their parents can't take them. They get out of work at seven, and by the time they get home to take them, they, they just, it doesn't work out. And it, so, so as I talk to you about the balance is difficult for me, it is 50 times harder for millions of other people. And those are the kinds of issues that I hope we can confront. Again, there's no magic federal government solution to that. But I do think we have to look for ways to empower people with the skills they need so they can find jobs that provide not just more pay, but more flexibility uh, in terms of how they work so that they can, they can do that other job that they have uh, more effectively. Senator, this last question is a particularly difficult one, I think. Considering the current immigration crisis, for example, the thousands of children left illegal by the border, what steps should be taken? Well, I think we have a broader immigration problem than simply what's happening at the border. And, uh, and I continue to believe that this country's status quo on immigration is bad for America and bad for the people who are trying to come here. The only people benefiting from the immigration status quo are human trafficking networks. So. I do think this issue needs to be confronted. It has been my opinion, and it was even during the time we were crafting our solution last year in the Senate, that we simply won't have the votes to pass any meaningful step in immigration until, and this is especially true now, given what's occurring, until we first address issues of the illegal immigration problem and bring that under control. You just aren't gonna have the votes in the House, and quite frankly, you may not have the votes in the Senate moving forward to address this issue of immigration until you deal with that first. Once you've dealt with that issue, I think you can move to step two, and that's modernizing our legal immigration system so that it's a 21st, system, 21st century system that works effectively for America. And then the third step in that process is we, we still have to address the fact that we have 12 million human beings living in this country, country in violation of Im immigration laws. And that will be a difficult issue to solve, politically and otherwise. I don't even think people are willing, I don't think you have the votes to even begin to consider it and pass it until you've done the first two. Um, assuming we can do those first two, then I think we need to be both responsible and, uh, and pragmatic about how to, how to resolve it. And I think people are willing to do that, but if they believe that the illegal immigration problem is under control and, and we're not gonna have this problem again in the future. And that's just my honest assessment of the situation, having been involved in it now pretty deeply for over a year. I just don't see how we ever get the support in Washington at any time in the next decade to address all three elements if you don't do the first step. And I think that's more true today than it was before this began. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. <laughs>